Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. It's a piece which is specifically about COVID-19. And for that reason, we've made it free for Top Med Talk listeners to use in their practice. COVID-19 ventilation strategies is a piece taken from the Dingle 2020 conference. Top Med Talk is, of course, the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. Make sure you check out ebpom.org for more information and content like this. That's ebpom.org. Hello, my name's Mervyn Singer. I'm at University College London, and I'd like to talk to you today about ventilatory strategies for COVID-19. I'll have one conflict to declare. I was involved with the development of the UCL Ventura CPAP device, so you can see where my conflicts lie. COVID has been an interesting experience in many ways and there was clearly a learning curve. This was a new disease. There were some differences but yet some similarities from standard ARDS. I think to my mind one of the greatest differences is the degree of pulmonary thrombosis, both macrovascular, the PEs that we can recognise on a CT scan, but also microvascular, and that's been very prevalent during post-mortem examinations. And as a consequence, there are likely differences in shunt fraction, right heart strain, failure, and so forth. There aren't any RCTs, but clearly people have learned at the bedside and practice has changed. And there's been moving targets in terms of beliefs, and I'll discuss in more detail this controversy of early invasive ventilation versus the use of non-invasive. There are fears about aerosolization, and these, certainly at the beginning, did impact on practice. Early intubation was recommended humidification wasn't given deferred tracheostomy was often performed there are known knowns there are things we know we know we also know there are known unknowns that is to say we know there are some things we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know we don't know and i think donald rumsfeld has it absolutely right so what are the known knowns i think there's general agreement that Patients shouldn't be allowed to tire excessively before placing them on a ventilator, if appropriate, if frailty comorbidities mean that they wouldn't be appropriate. And I think we've recognised that it is important and safe for the healthcare workers to give the patient active humidification because, you know, clearly there was an issue with thick sputum. However, there's a whole list of known unknowns and perhaps unknown unknowns too. What is the optimal timing and use of non-invasive ventilation? By the same virtue, the optimal timing of intubation and mechanical ventilation. The risks and benefits of spontaneous breathing-induced lung injury versus ventilator-induced lung injury. What level of PEEP should the patient benefit from once they're ventilated? When should a tracheostomy be performed in an individual patient's illness? What's the role of proning? In whom? For how long? Yes, in some patients the numbers do get very much improved, others they don't. Do we just continue for a fixed length of time? Do we only focus on the patients where there's a significant response? Likewise, the role of nitric oxide. In whom? For how long? We don't know the answer. What about high-dose steroids? So, the patients will likely be on low-dose dexamethasone, but if there's persisting or worsening ARDS inflammatory responses in the blood, should these patients be given a much higher dose of steroids? What's the role of therapeutic anticoagulation and in whom? So we're aware, as I mentioned earlier, about the markedly increased thrombosis seen in the lung, or perhaps not seen in the lung until post-mortem, should in this subset of patients we be more aggressive in terms of the dosing of anticoagulation. I'd like to use uh, this uh, diagram. This came from uh, Luigi Camperotta and colleagues at uh, GSTT and Luciano Gattinoni, which was a, a hypothesis as to how to modify respiratory support in view of the pathophysiological patterns uh, in COVID-19. And they describe three types of 
disease progression. An indolence shown in the blue, the patients become hypoxemic, uh, but then that's relatively stable thereafter. A hyperacute where the patient becomes acutely hypoxemic and continues to do so and deteriorate. And the biphasic response where they're initially stable and later on get this deterioration. And clearly, the greater the deterioration, there's an association with increased shunt, increased dead space, perhaps an increase in respiratory drive, and, and certainly worse hypoxemia. So, you know, these are all part of the interesting pathophysiology and response of the patient to COVID. And Luigi and colleagues suggest that initially the patients can be managed on oxygen supplementation and then there's a dotted line for non-invasive supports like high flow nasal cannulae or NIV CPAP and then a solid bar for IMV. Now the question is what is the precise role for non-invasive in my view it should be a solid line and perhaps the length of that line should be a bit greater than for IMV, something I'll come back to in a few moments. Obviously, uh, ECMO may have a role in some patients at the very severe end of the spectrum, but clearly who benefit, who doesn't, and it's a limited resource. So I, I think it's very much a case of trying to identify those who will most benefit, who perhaps wouldn't do so well on conventional ventilation. I've mentioned about prone positioning. Again, some patients, the numbers get better. Some patients, they don't. What is the impact on mortality? It's uncertain. The same with immunomodulation, whether it's high-dose steroids, as I discussed earlier, or other therapies to either suppress or maybe even boost the immune response. We don't know. And likewise, the use of inhaled nitric oxide. I'll uh, mention this briefly in a second. So again, lots of question marks. And as I again discussed before, the role of a bigger dose of an antithrombotic or even potentially a thrombolytic treatment should be considered. But we don't have good hard data on that point. So uh, Luigi suggested that depending on recruitability and the response to PEEP, then that should modify your strategy. Again, interesting idea, I'm not disagreeing with it, but it's speculation rather than hard fact. And he puts up the top this concept where we see patients early on in COVID who may be quite hypoxemic but have a relatively compliant lung and over the course, and especially with increasing severity, the compliance becomes less. Um, he's put there irreversible lung fibrosis. So I'm, I'm going to challenge that because I think one of the weird things about COVID is that how lung fibrosis actually improves very quickly. So I think if patients are going to get better, the rate of recovery seems anecdotally to be much faster than with standard ARDS. I mentioned uh, about inhaled nitric oxide. Um, so Nish Arakumaran, who's one of my colleagues, looked at NO use, inhaled NO use in 20 of our patients with COVID-19 and compared it against 14 ARDS patients in the last year or two who didn't have COVID-19 but did have ARDS. And there were no differences in age, ventilator settings, gas exchange, PF ratio, etc, etc. And there was a different response between the two cohorts. Those with COVID-19 only 40% showed an increment in PF ratio of more than 10%, whereas in the non-COVID patients, more than 70, well, 77%, 10 out of the 14 patients, showed a big incremental response. What does this mean in terms of pathophysiology? Maybe there's a greater you know, um, dead space because of thrombosis in the lung in the COVID patients, and clearly we don't know the impact on outcome. Certainly in non-COVID ARDS, nitric oxide often makes the numbers look better but didn't impact on mortality rates. Let me have a quick few words about aerosolization risk and uh, to paraphrase Franklin D. Roosevelt, 
during the Great American Depression in the 1930s, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And so there were these fears about aerosolization of the virus causing healthcare worker infection. And this did certainly at the beginning impact on practice worldwide. There were recommendations to intubate early, not humidify, don't do tracheostomies or do it under very strict PPE type conditions. And just to give a reflection of what happened around the world in America, the American Society of Anesthesiologists recommended that in patients with acute respiratory failure, it may be prudent to proceed directly to endotracheal intubation as non-invasive ventilation may increase the risk of infectious transmission. The Australians on the 16th of March actually recommended high flow nasal oxygen provided staff are wearing PPE, but they didn't recommend routine use of other types of non-invasive ventilation. But they did recommend lung protective mechanical ventilation. At the same time, UK guidelines were recommended, and here it was the opposite. They didn't recommend. They suggested high-flow nasal oxygen or similar devices should be avoided. And if you are going to use non-invasive, it should only be short periods as a bridge to invasive ventilation. However, with respect, I don't think uh, the literature was uh, examined that carefully. Uh, We wrote a correspondence to Lancet Respiratory Medicine highlighting that the evidence base wasn't that strong. And also a paper came out from uh, the, the London group and... It was published in Anesthesiology, and as you'll see from the highlighted quote, concern that use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or high-flow nasal cannula specifically leads to worse environmental contamination is not substantiated by current available evidence. So this was fear rather than hard fact. And in fact, even with a forceful, vigorous cough, virus could potentially spread seven to eight metres. So is um, an aerosolizing procedure significantly worse than somebody coughing violently. As some reassurance, Public Health England performed this study, which is out in preprint form, in eight hospitals in England, including UCH. And they sampled environmentally for COVID virus or coronavirus during the early peak and post-peak phases of the pandemic. And what did they find? They found it on about 9% of surfaces. So we're talking keyboards, um, bed rails and so forth. However, they didn't find much in the way of bacterial counts on these surfaces, suggesting that cleaning was effective. Importantly, the viral RNA was detected in only four of 55 air samples taken within a metre of four different patients. And in all cases, the concentration of viral RNA was low. And as you'll see, it's a tiny number. And they didn't recover any infectious virus from any of these four positive PCR samples. Okay, let's now just discuss this uh, controversy of silly versus villi. And the silly argument's been propounded in particular by Luciano Gattinoni. And the argument is that even with spontaneous breathing that may generate high transpulmonary pressures, putting strain on the alveoli, and this can actually induce damage, so self-induced lung injury. So analogous to high ventilator-delivered tidal volumes, but this is a patient, and as we see with COVID, many of these patients are hypoxemic, have a high respiratory rate, and a high minute ventilation. So his argument has been that silly may be potentially important. There have been, however, counter blasts. So this is from Martin Tobin and colleagues. For those that don't know Martin, he works in Chicago. He was the editor of uh, the Blue Journal. And obviously, uh, he's a very well-known ventilator expert, respiratory physiologist, and he's authored a big uh, textbook so he does know a little bit about what he's talking about and what did he comment in this article he 
wrote a fear of ventilator shortage during COVID panicked politicians into demanding car makers to branch into ventilator manufacture. Same in the UK. Some experts have argued that ventilation should be employed early to prevent COVID-19 progressing from mild to more severe disease and pointed out the Marini Gattinoni editorial I've just mentioned where they attest that vigorous, spontaneous inspiratory efforts can rapidly lead to patient self-induced lung injury. Silly. And based on this hypothesis, Gattinoni suggests radical changes to ventilator management in COVID-19, claiming that non-invasive options are of questionable value, intubation should be prioritised, and delayed intubation will cause a silly vortex that will induce more severe ARDS. He counterblasts that by saying that the existence of P-Silly is based only on the shakiest of circumstantial evidence and has yet to be exposed to the acid wash of experimental testing by different labs. However, Silly is being promoted as a raison d'etre for a radical approach to mechanical ventilation for COVID-19. So even if high tidal volumes and Silly play some role, for which he argues again there's no convincing evidence, this would not provide justification of liberal use of endotracheal intubation for which there are decades of research documenting fatal complications. A similar view was expressed by John Downs. And again, John Downs is one of the doyens of uh, American ventilator uh, physiology and developments. He came from Florida. And he put in this article that CPAP should not be confused with non-invasive ventilation. That they aren't physiologically equivalent and CPAP is designed to increase alveolar recruitment and resting lung volume rather than augmenting tidal volumes with BiPAP. And he suggests that CPAP will be beneficial by recruiting alveoli, improving lung compliance, decreasing the work of spontaneous breathing, reducing shunt and reversing hypoxemia. Furthermore, patients managed with CPAP don't require the same level of intensive care. And this is a crucial point. They don't need sedating, intubating, special monitoring, specialised trained caregivers, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, etc. And so this is a very different situation from intubated patients. And he argues that goals can be accomplished with devices that are readily available and easier to obtain the mechanical ventilators, which can then be reserved for the sickest patient. So if the early use of CPAP administered by face mask can decrease the need for intubation, the impending ventilator shortage should be significantly affected. And that something is clearly what happened in China and Italy. This is a correspondence I had at the beginning of March with Dubin. So Dubin is one of the uh, leading lights of Chinese critical care and He's sent by the Chinese government to disasters within China to coordinate the critical care response. And he was sent out to Wuhan. And this is what he wrote. He said, non-invasive and high-flow nasal cannulae are everywhere. He agrees with the WHO interim guidance that there may be a high failure rate and delayed intubation may eventually lead to death. However, you'll probably understand when they were overwhelmed with hundreds of patients with low saturations, there isn't enough resource for invasive mechanical ventilation. So even though there's a high failure rate, there'll be a high number of patients who will succeed and won't need intubation, thus sparing that critical care ventilator resource. And that's what they moved to in Italy. So you had this gory headline in one of our tabloids, and you can see there the picture. And interestingly, they were side by side having helmet CPAP. And I was in contact with many colleagues in Italy and again they'd embrace CPAP. Uh, On the right are the guidelines from the Ligurian region courtesy of Paolo Pelosi and I've got similar ones from the Lombardy region and other parts of Italy. And Guido Bertolini who was one of the leaders of the uh, 
COVID response team in Lombardy told me at the time, I haven't got any hard data, but I'm absolutely sure CPAP is the answer to keep people off ventilators. And I uh, communicated with about 10 different intensive care units and a large number could be kept off ventilators. They didn't have any reports of doctors or nurses caring for these patients ending up as intensive care patients themselves. Yes, they were wearing PPE as much as was available at the time and they weren't having issues with oxygen supply in their hospitals. So we took this on board, the lessons from China and Italy at UCH. And so early on in the pandemic, we decided with hospital approval to use CPAP to save intensive care beds and ventilators for those in major need, because we anticipated that London may indeed be badly hit. And thankfully there was strong buy-in from not only the doctors, but the nurses as well as the hospital management. So there was very much a team approach and so we developed an algorithm commencing at the emergency department to manage patients with CPAP if that's what they needed. There was a lot of training of doctors, nurses, etc. to manage CPAP in a dedicated respiratory ward and something I was involved with with David Brearley and our wonderful engineers I'll touch on briefly was developing, manufacturing more CPAP devices as we only had 12 standalone CPAP devices in the trust at the time. So this is uh, the COVID app which was launched on the 20th of March and I won't go through it in any detail but if the patients weren't responding to oxygen and didn't need immediate intubation they were given a trial of CPAP and depending on the response and their appropriateness to whether to proceed if need be to invasive ventilation that's what the algorithm delivered. As I mentioned we had this uh, actually dare I say it, quite fun uh, time trying to develop at pace a CPAP device and we reverse engineered the old Whisperflow Respironics wall CPAP device so it's purely mechanical um, we had the bright idea discussed with the engineers on the 17th of March Mercedes Formula One came on board and within 10 days they'd made a complete perfect replica of the whisper flow and this was regulated clinically test or volunteer tested I should say uh, and regulated within 10 days and then we proceeded to improve on the Mark 1 with a Mark 2 improving the interior of the uh, CPAP device and showing improvements in the patient circuit to give an up to 70% reduction in oxygen use as obviously hospitals or some hospitals in the UK were struggling with oxygen supply. This was submitted for regulatory approval and that came a few days later on the 2nd of April and by the 15th um, the Mercedes F1 people had made 10,000 of these devices which were delivered to the National Health Service. This has just come out in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, so it's quite a nice story. And if you want to read about it in more detail, please go to this article. Apart from us, other hospitals, especially in the London area where the COVID pandemic began in the UK, were quickly convinced of the, the worth of CPAP in keeping people off ventilators. And NHS guidance was modified on the 26th of March allowing the use of uh, CPAP as the preferred form of non-invasive support. And a few days later, the Intensive Care Society and the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine also put out um, a notice suggesting that, yes, there may be an important role for CPAP. Has it made a difference? There aren't at present any randomised controlled trial data. However, I think people have voted uh, with their eyes and their feet and uh, there's been actually quite a lot in the newspapers about the benefits and risks of being put on a mechanical ventilator, especially when intensive care units were under such severe strain. And apart from intensive care units, many hospitals develop their own respiratory units to offer CPAP outside a critical care environment. This um, came from Liverpool. Um, this was a cohort of 24 patients 
with hypoxemic respiratory failure and due to COVID who were deemed appropriate for intubation if needed and they didn't have any standard contraindication to the use of um, CPAP and they were able to safely administer it in a respiratory ward outside the critical care unit and more than half the patients avoided mechanical ventilation and in total 79% survived and were discharged. And here's the data as you can see they're quite sick the median FiO2 was 77% Medium respiratory rate, 33. And as I mentioned before, 58% were weaned off the CPAP and discharged. One died during CPAP. Nine were intubated, of whom four died and five survived. So Mike Rocott and colleagues at Southampton also uh, reported their uh, experience with using non-invasive ventilation. And they had two cohorts. The first were patients in whom invasive ventilation uh, was appropriate and these patients were admitted to the general ICU, they called these cohort one, and the second were patients managed on a level two area where non-invasive ventilation was the ceiling of care and they called these cohort two. So there were 79 in cohort one for full active management and of those 21% had to be immediately ventilated whereas 58, 73% had an initial trial of NIV. Of the immediate mechanical ventilation group, six died, eight went home, and because this was still fairly early days, five were still in the ICU and two on the ward. So we don't know final outcomes on any of, of their uh, groups. In those who had the initial trial of NIV, 31 were able to be managed on NIV alone, of whom 29 had gone home and two were still alive in the ICU. 27 progressed from NIV to mechanical ventilation. At the time of writing, three had died, eight had gone home, nine were still on the ICU, two had been referred for ECMO and five were well enough to go to the ward. So again, the general balance looks as if the majority of these patients did okay. In the cohort 2 group who were not for intubation and mechanical ventilation, of those 24, 17% went home and 83% died. So again, this was a, obviously a frailer, more COVID group, but still some patients were able to get home. We haven't yet reported our data from UCLH, but it's very similar to the Southampton experience, the Liverpool experience. Um, of the 468 admissions to our hospital, 124 received CPAP, so about a quarter. 45 of these 124 patients had CPAP as a ceiling of treatment, of whom 24% survived hospital. And of those having full escalation, who were initially given CPAP, about 60% were eventually intubated. The overall hospital survival of these 79 patients was 73%, including all 32 treated with CPAP only. And because this freed up our intensive care resource, we were able to transfer in 44 ventilated patients from neighbouring hospitals that were over full. Guys in St Thomas's adopted an early intubation approach and they reported their 28-day mortalities in this uh, letter in the BJA, they had 12% fulfilled mild criteria in terms of PF ratios, 56% moderate, 32% severe. So most of their patients were in a moderate PF ratio band when they were intubated. If you look at the 28-day mortality, it was 22% in those with mild ARDS according to the Berlin criteria when they were intubated, 40% in the moderate group, 62% in the severe group. You'll see down the bottom though that they still had quite a number of patients, about 20% in the moderate and severe group who were still in the ICU at 28 days, so we don't quite know their long-term outcomes. Going back to UCLH, and this has been submitted for uh, possible publication and it's under peer review at present but we looked at 93 patients 
who came to the UCH ICU for initial CPAP. Success was defined as those who survived hospital without the need for ventilation and failure. Either they died if CPAP was a ceiling of care, ceiling of treatment, or there was a need for invasive ventilation, regardless of whether they lived or died. Of note, this was a quite a sick group. So overall, the median PF ratio was 13. So that's on the cusp of um, moderate to severe respiratory failure, according to the Berlin criteria. And that, the initial respiratory figures, the patients were on a median of 80% oxygen, had a respiratory rate of about 33 on average. These di didn't discriminate between those who would do initially well or those that wouldn't. Interestingly, the inflammatory organ function and the dimer levels as a marker of potential thrombosis within the lung, apart from those who had known PE, was significantly different. Those who failed CPAP either died with it as a ceiling of treatment or needed intubation had much higher CRP levels, much higher NT pro BMP levels, and this is a logarithmic scale I'm showing, and the same for D-dimer, again a logarithmic scale, again significantly different. And the other interesting thing is that there was this marked disparity in terms of other organ support. So virtually all the patients that failed that needed mechanically ventilated needed to go on to vasopressor therapy. More than half needed renal replacement therapy and about half of these patients, just over half, eventually survived. So in the success group, there was no requirement for vasopressors, no need for renal replacement therapy. So is this due to an overall septic phenomenon or is it related to perhaps an increased thromboinflammatory status or an iatrogenic component? These patients were generally very heavily sedated, sometimes they had high airway pressures, maybe trying to keep them dry to protect the lungs all contributed to the need for vasoactive therapy and renal replacement therapy. This is quite an interesting uh, paper. Again, it's in preprint from the ICNARC group looking at changes in outcomes and treatments in three different phases of COVID. So it's pre-peak, peak and post-peak. And as you'll see here, they had about nine, ten thousand patients in there. The median age across the peaks were fairly similar. The Apache scores were similar. And I've highlighted the PF ratios. You can see that, if anything, they were a bit worse in the peak and post-peak period. This is in millimetres of mercury, about 115. Interestingly, there was this marked change in approach to ventilation. So within the first 24 hours, it dropped from 76% to 62% to 44%. So about a 40% reduction over the course of the pandemic. And at any point in treatment, fell from 84% down to 62%. The need for renal replacement therapy also fell from 32 to 23 percent and mortality also fell by about 25 percent from 44 percent to 34 percent. So clearly we haven't got sort of causality, we've just got association, but I do think this is suggestive. Final quick few words on uh, the recovery RS trial. This is obviously part of the recovery group trying to look at the role of non-invasive ventilation. So there are three groups, CPAP, high flow nasal oxygen or standard care, which is just an oxygen mask and patients can be entered when they're needing 40% oxygen or more and the saturations are 94% or below. And the idea is that if you are on the standard oxygen group, you shouldn't receive high flow, nasal oxygen or CPAP and proceed straight to intubation. And they want to enrol 4,000 patients over 18 months with a primary endpoint of a composite outcome of intubation or mortality within 30 days. And they're looking for a, a reduction from 15% to 10% in this composite event rate. And they're going to have 11 interim analyses. Now, 
Is this the right trial to do? I personally have my doubts. You know, if I was given the choice, you know, would I want to expose myself or a family member or indeed a patient to the risk of villi, the complications of sedation, nosocomial infection, etc., if avoidable? It is our standard practice for acute respiratory failure to try patients on high flow or CPAP and clearly if they're failing to proceed to invasive ventilation, why should it be different with COVID? And clearly, you know, there was a major benefit, which I think people recognise in saving precious intensive care and ventilator resource. Why then uh, abuse that uh, role? So to me, a more interesting question is looking at early or even prophylactic CPAP versus late CPAP. Does it modify the inflammatory response and patient deterioration? So in summary, there are still many known unknowns and unknown unknowns about how best to manage ventilation in COVID-19. CPAP does allow many patients to avoid mechanical ventilation, thus sparing critical care and ventilator resource. Clearly, patients who are failing on CPAP increase work of breathing, they're struggling. These patients need to be intubated and ventilated if appropriate to do so. Does it make a difference? As I mentioned, we don't have the RCT data, but I do think it's fair to say that it did spare resources and clearly also offers something in addition to patients where the ceiling of treatment doesn't include invasive ventilation. I'll finish there. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organising around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.